I suppose I want to kind of take you back to Ireland of the, the 1980s. I was a, quite a young adult then and a young, obviously, a female. It was a dismissive uh, society, ruled, legislated for and run in a very patriarchal context. Women and girls were controlled by the state and the church. We were intimidated, bullied, and they reigned over half a million of its population. On the surface, they were venerating us as mothers or Madonnas, maidens dancing at the crossroads. But when we dared to differ in opinion or make demands, well, then we became whores. Just ask Joanna Hayes. It was in this societal context, the context of the Magdalen laundries, the tomb baby sites, the forced adoptions, and the shame that the Eighth Amendment came into being, with 66% of the population voting yes. I was not among those 66%. As that young girl, as a young Republican, I instinctively knew that I, my friends, my sisters, we had no voice. We were smothered by the raging and damaging conservatism of the state that was led then by the church, that put my health, my sister's health, my friend's health at risk. We grew up with the trauma and terror of pregnancy, no sex education, no access to independent GPs who'd ring your mother if you went to uh, talk to them, no access to contraception. The dark ages for women and girls, yet it was only over three decades ago. Instead, I went to the library. I was fed up looking at uh, the horrific posters and the horrific quotes that my colleague uh, Paul Gavin uh, earlier talked about of what uh, we were doing to babies. And I went to the library and I tried to get some more information. I went to bookshops. I went to inform myself to actually get away from the rhetoric that was smothering me and my friends and my sisters more. 50% of our population, and we've come a long way. Many in the 1980s, we were young, we were on the cusps of a new, of a new generation. And it's taken another decade or three decades or so for the young people of today who have their voice and they are heard and they'll be heard in this repeal of the Eighth Amendment. I welcome and I thank the Citizens' Assembly and the report on the Eighth from the Joint Committee and especially that of Senator Noon. I'm recommending that the Article 40.33 be repealed and replaced so that women can avail of terminations in certain circumstances and that would include the risk to her health. The definition of health would not exclude or make a distinction between physical and mental health. And this is essential. We've had the X case, the Y case. We've had women coming back with babies in boxes. We've had all those women admitted to psychiatric hospitals because of their distress and because of the lack of legislation in this country. They've ended up being diagnosed as psychiatric mental illness and that is not on. That is not on. That's the fault of the state, and we need to uh, correct that. Of all the lobbying, the correspondence, uh, the emails, the phone calls, I got an absolutely one that moved me most was one from a beautiful woman, Anita, who lives in Tipperary. She allowed me to read out this to the, to the chamber. She's 44. I'm lucky I have a beautiful boy who is five. I would love to have another child, but sadly my age and my mental health means that pregnancy and the years after birth, birth would take a toll on me. I was aware that due to my previous mental health history, there was a very strong chance that I would develop postnatal depression. And indeed, it did. I can't really express how difficult I found the first six months of motherhood. Society would have you believe it's the most special time of a woman's life, but I just found it hell, and I felt so guilty. Parenthood is tough, but even tougher when you're dealing with demons in your head, telling you every moment of every day that you're a terrible mother and your baby hates you. Over the years, I gave abortion very little thought, but I got pregnant at 38, 
and I asked my GP innocently, what would happen if there was a major problem with my baby or with my health and it was best to end the pregnancy? When he replied, well, you'd have to go to England, suddenly the realisation of the Eighth Amendment and how it affects every aspect of women's pregnancy hit me. I would love more than anything to have another child for my son to have a sibling, but the stress that this would put on me is too much to risk. Can you honestly hand on heart say that you're okay with keeping me pregnant against my will, knowing how much trauma it will put me through? I found that really thoughtful and provoking, and thank you, brave Anita. Whatever replaces the legislation, we need to provide a wide range of comprehensive health and reproductive services in which equality is realised and control is given to our women and girls to decide over their own health and well-being. Again, I thank the Eighth Amendment Committee and its report, which reaches out to not just the women and the girls, but also our men and our society, providing for a kinder, compassionate, understanding and ultimately a safer society that repeal, this will repeal this draconian, smothering legislation, support our women and girls in difficult circumstances. The status quo is untenable and it is insupportable. We need to remove the dark shadow over the daily lives of half of the population of this Ireland. I trust the medical experts. I trust myself. I trust women. You need and we need to trust also. Gurumila Malgoth. Yes,